I've got a question for you before we read scripture together. I wonder, have you ever thought or assessed yourself for what kind of a problem solver are you? Have you thought about it, specifically today when you woke up? Well, what kind of a problem solver do you think there is? There's a couple categories. We're gonna think about them today. So when conflict arises in your space, in your family, at work, with your kids, at the grocery store, at Starbucks, I don't know, how is it that you resolve it? What happens in your body and in your mind and in your spirit when you think about resolving it? Most of us would likely rate ourselves much more generously, yes or yes. Some of you guys were like, I got this one, I'm so good. <laughs> right, you passed. And I think the reason for this is because I think we're a little bit of idealists, right? Like we really believe in ourselves and that's a good thing, but we like to think that in moments of conflict that we would react a certain way, but as we know, when the time comes, our actual responses might be a little bit different than what we thought we were going to do, right? So in those moments, sometimes we reveal what our actual priorities are as a person, and uh, for the sake of today's thought journey, it might even tell us a little bit more truthfully about where our priorities are as people of faith and followers of Jesus, because I like to think that everything that we're doing in some way is telling others and saying of ourselves, this is who I am and what I believe, and that encompasses our faith. There's an old saying, it's easier said than done, and I think this is true when it comes to being a true follower of Jesus, and in particularly, um, true when we look at the book of Philippians, which we're going to be in for the next three weeks. Myself, Pastor Devo next week, and then Pastor Raywin will be talking about what it means uh, to be followers of Jesus according to the book of Philippians. And in particular, we'll be thinking about practicing peace. Are we the people of Jesus? Are we a community of disorganized conflict stirrers or are the people of Jesus a community of peacemakers? And what does it mean to be a maker of peace? So as we get ready to dive in, I invite you to stand for the reading of God's word. As we do here, as we have done for a very long time, if you're new, we do this thing where we stretch our limbs and we stand for the reading of God's word. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, whom I love and I miss, this is Paul speaking, who are my joy and crown, stand firm in the Lord, says Paul. Loved ones, I urge, I urge Eodia and I urge Syntyche to come to an agreement in the Lord. Yes, and I'm also asking you, loyal friend, to help these women who have struggled together with me in ministry of the gospel along with Clement and the rest of my work, co-workers whose name are in the scroll of life. The word of God. Please be seated. This is not the usual part of Philippians that gets highlighted. Yeah, how many of you memorized this when you were in Sabbath school? You guys are like, I know this one. This is not the typical one, right? Uh, different parts of chapter four are usually highlighted, but there's so much goodness happening here, so we're gonna see what's going on. The church of Philippi was the first Jesus community that Paul started in Eastern Europe. Philippi, this space, was a Roman colony that was known for their patriotic nationalism in ancient Macedonia. This would prove to be extremely challenging for Paul, who was trying to share the good news of Jesus as the true king of the world. That's difficult because there's already a king, and Paul is messing with the already standing king, right? No less, Paul plants a church, and thanks to the leaders and members of the church, it thrives and it grows even in spite of challenges and persecution of the Christian followers in their time. This letter to the church community in Philippi is really quite astounding, I think, because it's so incredibly affirming, right? Like, if you need to pick me up, read this. He's so proud of his community. 
Paul, from his prison cell, writes of his love and admiration for this church of Philippi. The beginning of the letter in Philippians chapter one, Paul opens his letter with this phrase and praise of thanksgiving. And he's sharing this letter with praises, showering this letter with praises, because they were the church he was remembering. They were the people that stayed the course even in the midst of difficulty. When the church wasn't popular in the community, right? They stayed the course. Or when the church was speaking against the common political opinion, the church of Philippi, they stayed the course, keeping their eyes on Jesus and pointing others to do the same. And this letter, it's also a reminder that that being a church community does not make one immune to being human. And the reality that we don't always get it right, right? In fact, Paul, as he's praising people, he's also reminding the community to remember each other's contributions. It's important to remember in the midst of chaos that there is good that has happened in this place, right? Remember each other's contributions and to remember the value and the impact that these members have already had in their community. Paul was aware, however, that more often than not, when chaos arises, we lose our cool, right? We lose our peace. And sometimes, yes, and sometimes, it seems that chaos takes up way more room in our lives than the peace that we once had. The two women that Paul is talking about, who would, these are admired co-workers and leaders of the church, the way that Paul is talking about them, he's describing them, they must be pretty significant people in their space, right? They have had some sort of disagreement. So we have Paul taking this moment in the middle of this letter, this large letter that starts in chapter one, and he's taking a moment to reflect and address this disagreement between these two beloved leaders of the church. More interesting to me is that Paul does not give us details about what happened in the disagreement. He's not worried about the details of strife and trouble, but simply that Paul tells the people, hey, sort it out. Don't forget what you're doing here in the first place. So Paul reminds me, actually, um, as I've been reading these verses this week, of what it was like growing up in my house. Um, If you don't know, I am one of eight children. It's a lot, tribe of Judah, right? It's just the tribes of Israel. Um, And I cannot imagine, for those of you who are parents, you might um, uh, resonate with some of this. I cannot imagine what it was like at any given point in time for eight different voices to be yelling, Mom! Mommy! Mom! And it was always really high-pitched, right? Like, we only had one pitch way up there. And then it was always followed by, So-and-so did this to me, right? I heard this so much growing up that at one point I feel like I tuned it out, right? I stopped hearing the urgency of complaints and I feel like my mother was very similar to Paul and his attitude this way because she would say to the older siblings in particular, um, help, your, help your younger siblings out. You have to help them figure it out. I'm working on something else right now. So you figure it out. And most of the time I feel like it was around dinner time so it was probably hanger pains, right? No less, my mom, while she was interested in our well-being, she too must have refined her ear for the kind of strife that needed her attention and the kind of strife that we really could sort out ourselves. She would also say to us, don't fight amongst yourselves, she would say. You are family. Family isn't supposed to fight. You're supposed to take care of each other. You're not supposed to destroy each other. I just, side note, she used to say this in Spanish. So there is an extra umph. No tienen que pelear con ustedes mismos. ¿Qué les pasa? What is wrong with you, she would say. There are plenty of other people, she would mention, out there already trying to destroy you. You don't need to do that to each other. And then she would follow, is there really nothing that could possibly happen between you that you can't figure out? So maybe Paul is saying the same thing. What do you think? 
Are there really things in our lives and in our world that we really can't figure out? Or is it more that there are things in our world and in our lives that we're not willing to figure out? I've been reading this book called um, A Small Book About a Big Problem by Edward Welch. It's a 50-day thought journey on anger, patience, and peace. So if you're looking for a really good read and prompts for 50 days, I would recommend this one. He is a pastor psychologist. Great book. So he addresses the fact that each of us has this creature deep down inside of us. He calls it anger, the anger creature. And I think that when we talk about what it means to practice peace, as we're going to be doing for these next few weeks, we have to talk about what, what it is that keeps us from the place of peace. And a lot of the times, a source that keeps us at arm's length from peace is actually anger. But hear me out, anger in and of itself is not a bad thing, okay? I'm a huge advocate for feeling your feelings. And anger, along with all of the other emotions, happiness, joy, jealousy, sadness, anger, they tell us things about us. They tell us about what is important to us, right? And so author, this author, uh, Welsh, reminds us that emotions are what make us human. They separate us from all the other creatures in the world. It is a beautiful thing to possess emotions, right? Like the feels, we've been feeling some feels. I feel like we've been feeling some feels in our community. It's a lot of feels. But like a couple weeks ago when we were in this very sanctuary in space and we said goodbye to a beloved friend and pastor, Pastor Chris, those were real emotions, right? They meant that we have loved someone and that someone has loved us back. Or maybe like last weekend when we said goodbye to a different friend in a different way if you were in the room when we said goodbye to our friend Jody Cahill who is now sleeping in the comfort of Jesus. This room too filled with people who loved and adored Jody and her family. And those emotions that came up as we heard stories about her and watched videos about her, they reminded us what it was like being a part of this person's life and what they brought into our community, how it changed us and moved us. Those were necessary emotions and they were real. Or maybe we can think back to over a year ago when we first heard about the death of George Floyd. This will forever be a name in all of our history. It will also mark a time where we saw the frustration and anger and pain of our community and our nation arise, right? Our emotions, they said something. Our emotions, they declared something great and it could not be ignored. We could not walk away then and we cannot walk away now. Emotions, they exist in these large communities, and emotions, they also exist within us, within you, as a single body. I think that the happier and the lighter emotions don't seem to be the kinds of emotions that create conflict and chaos, right? Like, when's the last time you saw a riot arise over happy people? That's not a thing, right? These emotions are not the ones that fracture our relationships. These emotions are not the one that make us dread holiday gatherings, right? So we have to look at the ones that do. And we have to address how to manage those emotions when they come because they will come and they ought to come. Jesus felt his feelings. We know this. Jesus experienced anger, it's an important emotion. He experienced anger when he saw vendors at the temple selling faith and forgiveness. Jesus experienced anger with his leaders of the temple when they were way more interested in protocol than with healing the blind. 
or healing the hurt. Jesus was indignant when the disciples wanted to keep children away from him. Even though they were good intention, Jesus was very, very particular. He wanted to welcome everybody into his space. Jesus grew angry any time people's welfare was at stake. So anger can be justified, and maybe it has some purpose, and Paul, like Jesus, points to a greater existence beyond anger. So we see anger, but we have to exist beyond it. As we feel our feels, as they say, we have to know the difference between feeling our feelings and living our lives out of only those feelings. There is a difference. So let's look really quick at some conflict styles. We talked about we're gonna see some conflict styles. There's five, I really like this graphic. Conflict handling intentions. This is meant for coworkers, but we're talking about coworkers in scripture and church community, and we're a church community, so it's relevant. So we've got high and low on concern for others. This is cooperativeness. That's a really good word. Say that five times really fast. And then on the horizontal line here, we have low and high concerns for yourself, assertiveness, right? So which one do you think that you're in? Are you, are you low and low? Are you have low concern for others and low concern for yourself? That's rough. The pastors are here to pray for you afterwards if you're on the low, low, okay? And that means you're avoiding. You're in personal complier. You're just like, you see a problem, you're like, oh, I got a phone call coming. I gotta go check my emails right now. Okay, or maybe you're on the uh, high concern for others but low concern for yourself. Mm. That is accommodating. You're a friendly helper but could use some adjusting because that means you're the yes man. You're the yes human, right? Are you at a low concern for others? Okay, that's a thing. But you have a high concern for yourself, right? You're competitive. You're, you're, a, you're a tough battler. These are those of you who don't like to lose in Monopoly. So you'll play for 12 hours during Christmas because you will not lose. There's some of those humans in my family. Or are you high on the concern for others and high on the concern for yourself? I believe this is one of the ideal spaces to be because there's this beautiful word, you are a collaborating person. This is where I believe that Paul would like us to think about problem solving. We are problem solvers. And then in the middle, there is compromising, maneuvering, uh, somebody who can do a little bit of all of the things. All of us can exist in any of these spaces at any given time. What's the one that we exist in the most, right? Which one do you identify with? When we took a look at scripture, for example, conflicts, they are everywhere. They're in abundance, my friends. Because human beings, we are, from the beginning of time, we have mastered conflict, yes or yes. Yeah, and scripture is also, I wanna remind you, full of alternatives to conflict. So there is conflict and then there is more than conflict. We call it peace. Today we're calling it peace. The alternative is peace. In the Old Testament, we are familiar with this word, shalom. And in the New Testament, it's this word, irene. Old Testament, right? Shalom can be defined as complete or whole. It refers to something uh, that is whole with no cracks in it, like a piece of stone, or it can also refer to a complete stone wall. Think of a large stone wall, a wall that has no gaps and no missing bricks, right? This is what shalom means in the Old Testament. More significantly though, shalom refers to something that is complex, like our lives, with many different moving parts, relationships, and situations, and that it, even in its complexity, is in a state of wholeness and completeness. This is shalom. So when any of our relations are, are out of alignment, we are out of shalom. We are outside of peace. 
and peace has broken down. Shalom has broken down, like a stone wall breaking down. When we use shalom as a verb, and it has broken down, right, this, this verb, then, then what follows is the action, as scripture tells us, to restore it, right, and to bring it back to a state of wholeness. So in our verse today, Paul recognizes the conflict. He recognizes that there is a hole and there is something somewhere in the community of Philippi in between these two women that has broken. Something has broken down. And his plea is for these two women to attend to this brokenness. And he says, come to an agreement in the Lord. Or like the message Bible says, iron out the differences and make up by restoring it and bringing it back to completeness. The relational completeness and restoration of these two leaders of the church is not only for the two of them, though they benefit greatly, right? It's so good when we fix something between friends, coworkers, or people. But it just so happens that if these two people can figure something out, it actually benefits the entire community because they are leaders in a community. Because peace, my friends, not only means that we stop fighting, it means that we start being people who cooperate and work together. It's not just stopping doing something, it's recognizing that thing, yes, stop doing it, and start doing something else, right? In the New Testament, Paul reminds us in the book of Ephesians that Jesus is our Eden, Jesus is our peace. He who comes to restore all of our relationships, he is that peace of peace. And he will help make all of us whole and is making all of us whole. Jesus gives his life so that you and I might have an opportunity at making things whole, right? And then he asks each one of us with this peace already inside of us, this means that we don't have to go anywhere to go get peace. I think this is really important to understand. It's like faith, right? Oftentimes we think we have to do something or go somewhere to get it. If I just pray enough, if I just go to church on Sabbath enough times in the year, my friends, within you is already peace. When the Lord breathed, breath into you, there was found faith and this beautiful peace. So he says to his followers, Eodia and Syntyche, and you and I are being called to the same thing, to take that peace within us and to make and create peace outside of us. As churches, when we are called to keep our peace and be makers of peace, it will require work, my friends. It will require humility. It will require patience. It will require that we bear with one another with love. When we become people of peace, we are participating in the life of Jesus, who was and is the ultimate way to be in agreement with God, as Paul is asking. So what makes it difficult for you in your life to bring peace and to make peace? Can you think of something? What story are you hanging on to in your life that that continues to spin on replay that concludes that there really is no other way to rebuild or restore back to wholeness? Is there a hole hanging out in your spirit somewhere? Isn't it interesting that it's so much easier to hold on to pain and hurt and anger than it is to move to resolving it? Which is really strange, right? Because resolving is the very thing that would alleviate the pain that we're feeling, but it's so much harder to restore that. And we would rather hang on to the pain of everything else. The practice of peace, it takes time and it's possible. 
I think that there's purpose in Paul's wanting the leaders of the church to find peace amongst themselves. Because when we can stop fighting amongst ourselves, then it means that we have eyes and ears out towards the world to listen for what the Spirit is calling us to be agents of help and hope for, right? Recently, I was in a waiting waiting room Uh, at a doctor's office, and I was reminded of just how easy it can be to get distracted and to let opportunities to be a blessing pass us by. And I feel like we can all think of a few things that really need our attention in the world. As I was waiting in the waiting room, just minding my own business, scrolling through Instagram, as is one to do in waiting rooms, There were two receptionists that uh, came to hang out with each other. And I will just, won't give you the play-by-play, I'll give you some of the very interesting topics they chose to vocalize very loudly in the waiting room. They wanted to talk about vaccines and people they considered anti-vaxxers. They were very passionate about it. They wanted to talk about the U.S. border and people who should and should not be crossing. They said uh, they wanted to talk about what was on the news this morning. And in fact, at one point, there was a disagreement. And one person says to the other, I want you to show me. Find the video. I want to see it right now. And I was like, oh, here we are. I'm off duty. I'm at the doctor's office. They became so passionate in their discussion. And at one point, I realized that the phone was ringing and ringing and ringing in the background. But they couldn't hear it because they were really busy about the things that they were talking about. I thought to myself, I really hope nobody's having an emergency right now. Paul is not suggesting we're never gonna disagree. He is suggesting that we get better at resolving when things come up that could be limiting our effectiveness in the world as people of God. And we can't miss we can miss that sometimes, and, and we won't always get it right ourselves, and sometimes that means that we might need the community to help us out. There's so much in these three verses that are happening here. Sometimes our vision for peace is clouded. This is what Paul is suggesting, and sometimes we need help. We need a mediator. So Paul is recognizing that maybe these two women mentioned They have come to the point where they need extra help because they can't hear anything else but the problem between them. And they can't seem to restore the relationship on their own, so Paul is asking other believers to step in and help restore the hole that was just made in the wall of the community. And isn't that beautiful though, my friends, that the people of God can be agents of peace for one another? That you can be people here who come to church and not just be the person that sits behind me in the pew every single Sabbath, but you can turn around and look at each other's faces and help each other out, be agents of help in each other's lives. It's my favorite part of the story, my friends, because Paul isn't outsourcing. You know what he's saying? He's saying that you have everything that you need in your community right here. You have everything that you need to make it work. Last year, you have everything you need to be a people of hope and peace. And he is reminding us that we are the experts of our story. He's reminding us that no one has to leave their story behind. Your story doesn't become any less significant or important. Your experience doesn't become any less or less significant because somebody else has a different experience. Paul is reminding us that no one has to leave their story behind. But this is what it means to be of one mind in Jesus, that we don't have to have the same thoughts or agree every single time, but we do have to have our priorities straight, that we lead with kindness and with compassion and with empathy. We might be able to take some cues from our young people because kids happen to have a really a great way of arriving at a place of peace really quickly. So this is my last story here. But we might be able to take our cues from them. A while back on the playground as I was helping the third graders during PE at La Sierra Academy, we were in a unit of jump roping. 
Yes, my friends, there's an entire unit of jump roping, and we were in it. Then shortly after instructions, we got to teach, you know, you know, just become an expert at jump roping overnight. You got to try. So we give the kiddos some instructions, and they're trying it out. Kiddos are grabbing jump ropes here and there. And I'm helping someone here and there, you know, adjusting the jump rope to size. And then somewhere on the opposite side of where I was, there was a really strong argument coming uh, between two boys, I heard. They were so passionate. <clears throat> And they were using some pretty strong words that I'm sure they collected from some of the adults in their spaces. But from a distance, I heard one kiddo say, you are wrong, he said. Then the other kid said to him, no, you are. And then the other kid says to the other one, no, it's my turn, and you took my turn. And the child says to the other one, no, I did it. And there was a foot stomp. I had to get over there after the foot stomp. But isn't this the basis of most of our arguments? When I came over, both kids were on the verge of tears. And you could see that these words really had the ability to wound one another. We talked it out for a bit. And then I asked them, do you think that there's a way that we can solve this problem? What do you all think? And then both of the kids look down at their shoes, a little reluctantly, and they both said, yes. And I asked them, what do you think could happen differently through this moment right now? And then one of the kiddos said sweetly, well, maybe, maybe we can take turns. Third graders are wise. Maybe you can take turns, I said. Then one of the other kiddos said, well, well, maybe, maybe you can go first and then I'll go next. <laughs> and then from nowhere, the spirit is so good at this stuff, and out of nowhere comes another kid and says, ma, you can take my jump rope, I'm done. Then you can both have a jump rope. And he walked away. I, I was like, what's happening? <laughs> oh. Everyone's face is lit up there, my friends. And in a moment, conflict could have overtaken the entire PE time and relationship. But instead, there was a moment of resilience. And there was a priority for the greater good. And there was wholeness restored. Both kids apologized to one another. And then they skipped away and they had their jump ropes in their hand. It's like nothing, nothing ever happened. Friends, there are so many ways that we can exist and coexist in the world. I wonder if this week you might choose peace. One of my favorite local songwriters, you may or may not know him, starts with a K and ends with an Evan. Um, I have been thinking about his song, um, Lord, give blessing to the quiet while Kevin has written this song as um, attending to our LGBTQ plus community as a bridge. It reminds me that there are so many ways that we can, re we can be bridge builders, right? That, that we can see holes and attend to them, even if it's not our own, that we can be a community for one another. But this blessing is beautiful, and we're going to sing it in a moment. But these are the words. May the peace of God guard your heart and your mind. And may all the saints, you are the saints, we are the saints of the community, greet you kind. May God's purposes be revealed in time. My friends, there's so much God has for us to see. We have to pay attention. May we all be one in Christ, my friends. May we all be one in Christ. Amen. Amen.